Sidewalk Labs is this amazing opportunity to bring a bunch of technologists together with a bunch of urbanists to take advantage of the amazing things that technology has to offer with a deep understanding about what really makes cities tick. Instead of saying a problem is just about technology or it's just about policy, in most cases the answer is it's both. We find the very best people in the world who can go and think about solving those types of problems. Tonight's event focuses on the question, what can technology do to help cities improve housing affordability? I'm Chris uh, Valenzo from Ali, uh, co-founder and CEO. Uh, founded the, uh, the business with my brother, Andrew, uh, 2008, I guess it was, um, when we officially incorporated the business. And it was at the time, it was uh, following his own experience moving to New York. And they say that necessity is the mother of all invention, and it was definitely the case for us as well. So I want to give you just like a, a brief um, kind of overview of why we founded Ali, and then I'll go into a little bit more about what it is, but the why is really important here. Um, I was, when I moved to the city, it was 2003, and I was part of what I now understand to be the 10% of the demographic that's uh, you know, cohabitating with a significant other, my now wife. But at the time, my brother moved about a year and a half behind me. And when he moved to the city, he said, you know, hey, I'm gonna need to you know, crash on your couch for a little while until I figure things out. Well, that worked for a little while. He was looking for, um, for a place. He eventually found something, and he comes to me and my mom, and he asked us to be his guarantor. I said, oh, okay, you know, I'll do that. Um, but then he shows me a one-bedroom apartment, and I'm thinking, wow, that's you know, that's pretty bold of you. I know you can't even afford a studio in this city, and you're asking me to guarantee a one-bedroom apartment for you. And he said, uh, oh, you don't understand. You know, I've got this uh, living room in this unit, and I can chop it up and turn it into a couple extra bedrooms, and I can put those on Craigslist. And, I, and he showed me Craigslist, and I said, okay, I see. There's a, actually looks like a, a real market there. You can rent them out. When he did that. He ended up, the living room became two bedrooms, and the, on Craigslist, he posted it, and within two days, he got 90 responses. And people were saying they'll take it sight unseen, they'll even pay him more than he's asking. So we took the listing down off of Craigslist, because he wasn't gonna be able to sift through 90 responses, and he put it back up at a higher price. He did that three more times before actually whittling down the number of responses to, like a, something that was more tenable for him to actually work through. Now, that was great for him, but you know, awful for the 90 responses that he received. Awful, you know, awful for them to have to go through that, um, uh, to be in this rat race for housing that's actually attainably priced in this city. So the number one pain point that Ali is solving, there's a lot of bells and whistles to what Ali is doing, but the number one pain point behind Ali is that we're addressing the affordability crisis. Um, what I think, you know, and that's why attainably priced luxury is re really what we lead with. Um, Ali's at the intersection of urban co-living or communal living, um, affordability, and lifestyle relevant services. If you think about um, a pure residential product, rental product, on one end of the spectrum, and then a hotel on the other end, um, living at Ali is kind of somewhere in between. It's kind of like living in a hotel in certain regards, um, and I'll get into that. But again, the number one problem is that cities are expensive, and if you don't earn, say, you know, in a lot of these cities, seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars a year or even more, then you you're not welcome in the official housing market. You've been priced out of the official housing market. <laughs> but the good news is um, there's a solution to this. The problem is a man-made problem that relates back to space, and there's a man-made solution for it. UCLA did a study, um, it was actually about 10 years ago now, where they followed people around their homes, and what they found was that when they're in their home, 90% of their time was being spent utilizing only 40% of the home. So the affordability crisis is not, it's artificial. I mean, it's real, but it has a solution. It's real because the developer community, in an effort to just clone the same building they did yesterday, or yes, you know, yesteryear, they're bringing the same product to market, and it's oversized relative to the actual needs of the consumer. 
Um, and in the process of being oversized, it's overpriced. With uh, this, you know, a threshold being pushed higher and higher uh, on affordability, it's created a massive underground housing market. My brother was a good example of that. Um, and we end up living, you know, at a minimum we live with strangers, uh, but we also are increasingly living with parents. Over a third of our population is living with parents. And we're even, you know, finding makeshift spaces. Interestingly enough, I was in um, San Francisco not too long ago meeting with a VC. At the end of the meeting, one of the partners pulls me aside and she says, I wasn't going to say this, but I live in a closet under a stairwell. <laughs> so we're living in closets too. Um, so again, the, the big idea here is actually to go small, to drive, to right size the, the unit size. If we take 200 square feet out of an apartment, so from a 500 square foot studio, say, to a 300 square foot studio, that frees up $200,000 from the development budget between land cost, hard cost, soft cost, financing cost. That's as good to an investor, that's as good as freeing up $10,000 a year from the annual, from the annual budget. And so the question is, what do we do with the $10,000 that we free up at Ollie as a provider of micro studios and shared suites? And the answer is, we find the balance between these three buckets, between delivering savings to the resident, returning to them a lower price point, providing an all-inclusive layer of services and amenities uh, and with community finding that, and enhancing the profitability of the project so that the developer has an incentive to do more. At the end of the day, what we're doing though is we're saving our residents money with the services and conveniences that we're providing them. We're saving them time. And with the community that we're building, we're helping them have more fun. I want to just zero in on the saving money portion of this. It's not just that we're charging less in rent. It's also than a, than a conventionally sized studio, but it's also that we're embedding what would otherwise be hidden living expenses. Right? Virtually all of our residents with or without us would have purchased Wi-Fi. They would have all needed furniture. But so there are necessities that we know that they need that we can buy in bulk for them. And by the way, the furniture, how many times have you seen on large trash pickup days, you know, sofas or cabinets or you know, whatever, sitting curbside, that is all waste in the system. That's, part of that is a function of the fact that we're you know, moving to cities, we're only planning to be there for a couple years, we're making a trip to Ikea, to make our purchases, um, but we're not intending, those aren't lifetime purchases that we're making. Those are intended to be two year, you know, two year purchases and then they go to the curb. That is all waste, it's environmental waste, but it's also economic waste in the system. It's waste in the system just like square footage that you don't pay for, or that you don't utilize, is waste in the system. So quality of life at Ali is really not measured by the quantity of square footage and what we find is when you spend less on living space, you can spend more on the enrichment of the experience. We think about the three C's, convenience, comfort, and community. And everything that we're doing is um, really anchored to, to one of those three things, enhancing convenience, comfort, or community, apart from actually driving more affordability. Community, when you're building uh, projects like we are at large scale, so we have 400, 500 bed um, projects, Community, it's not enough to come into a, you know, maybe a, it's a lot easier in a townhouse to create uh, a sense of community when there's, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 people and they're all kind of doing the same thing for a living or they all look the same. Creating community in a diverse setting in a large scale project is very different. And that's why we have a values oriented community system anchored in these four values inclusiveness, discovery, wellness, and sustainability. The sustainability piece is partly inherent in what we're doing. Simply by um, creating more density, we're essentially housing what would normally take two buildings to house, we're housing in one. So if you think about all the carbon emissions that come with lighting and heating and cooling, uh, two buildings, now we're cutting that down to one, we're driving per capita emissions, uh, carbon emissions dramatically lower, and that's just uh, just by a function of the model, not doing anything special other than just delivering the business. Here's a look at uh, one of our spaces. This is Carmel Place. This is the uh, project that Eric mentioned, uh, one of eight 
in our portfolio. Uh, we have two that are operational today. This space was outfitted by our director of design, uh, Jacqueline Schnett, and we rely heavily on resource furniture, um, furniture systems. About 70% of our furnishing budget is allocated to resource furniture items, and that's because, as you see here, it'll, it allows us to do more with less space. So this is one system. The bed retracts out of the wall, uh, comes down on top of the sofa, and all you have to do is move the, the cushions. You get living room and bedroom functionality um, all in one. We take the same approach with desks that turn into dining room tables and, and other items as well. So innovation, we always say innovation is not just digital. Innovation takes a lot of forms. Um, and we look at the housing unit um, as well as the technologies that go into delivering the living experience um, all with an eye toward innovation, recognizing that it's not necessarily all digital. We have appeal in our shared suites, which are part of the mix as well as small studios, um, predominantly with a millennial demographic, but there's a long tail of other that we, it's important for us not to alienate. It's long distance commuters, it's recent divorcees, it's young couples living together without children, uh, baby boomers, one out of every four email inquiries that we get is from a boomer. Our amenity program, is because of the scale of the projects that we're doing. This is a Hudson Yards uh, project that we're working on. Because of the scale of these projects, we have great amenities, and we're actually networking them together. So if you're a resident in one building, you're getting access to the amenity program in a mall. This is our Journal Square project that's now underway. Uh, we have innovative solutions in the home as well. This is a, uh, a program that we're rolling out, a refillables program. And this has additional environmental sustainability benefits because we're eliminating packaging by refilling the shampoos, the soaps, the conditioners. Um, and that's something that our housekeepers, you're getting a housekeeper when you move in to Holly, that's something that the housekeepers are able to refill on a regular basis. Um, we have a resident portal. You can manage your entire life. Uh, one of my favorite features is um, that we're integrated with Slack in our resident portal. Our live-in community managers are monitoring the Slack channel and able to, um, to really uh, answer any immediate questions or needs of our consumers. A lot of other bells and whistles on it. Bedvetter is a really great tool that we're launching where um, think about something my brother didn't have with his experience going through 90 potential roommates. He didn't have anyone helping him figure out if they were compatible or not. Bedvetter, which the name's a little fun and cheap, Bedvetter is meant uh, to really be more like a dating-based algorithm, uh, but for roommates. So I think I'll leave it there. One, oh, this is one other item I should mention. Our, our Alibox um, shop allows our residents to purchase pre-curated design accents, essentially save them the trip to CB2 or uh, another store. Um, items that are, it's really the essentials, the items, you know, everything you need and nothing you don't, um, pre-curated together and allows our residents to customize the look of their space. These are removable wallpapers that are offered. Um, so I'll leave it there for, for now, but thank you all for listening.